Hello and welcome to DSA Presents. I'm Deirdre Silverman and my guest today is Paul Bedard, who is a directing fellow at the Hangar Theatre this summer. And this show is DSA Presents. DSA stands for Democratic Socialists of America. So it's always a special pleasure when we get to talk to someone who is a fellow member of DSA. And Paul belongs to the New York City chapter mm -hmm. of DSA and is active there. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight is the intersection of politics and theater. So why don't we start by talking about what you're doing in Ithaca this summer? Yeah, so I am d doing a fellowship uh, it's sponsored by the Drama League and is hosted at the uh, Hangar Theater. Um, I'm spending eight weeks in Ithaca. I'm doing, I, I just finished directing a children's show. I did The Emperor's New Clothes. Um, I also did a studio experiment where I had, you know, 20 hours of rehearsal, uh, but no public presentation. And on that, I did an experiment of how do we live stage a debate, a uh, presidential mm -hmm. debate, and we did the infamous debate between uh, Kennedy and Nixon from oh, 1960. Interesting. Um, and now, uh, actually today, I just had our first rehearsal for The Infernal Machine, which is a great play by Jean Cocteau, um, and it is an adaptation of the Oedipus myth that really takes a strong look at class. So I'm doing all three shows, and I taught a class on devised theater. Um, I'm also producing a show this summer. Doing a whole bunch of stuff. All at the hangar? <laughs> All at the hangar, oh, yeah. That's great. So the the Cocteau show, um, when we're recording this on June 29th. Um, when is that going to be playing? So that's going to be next week. It's July 9th and 10th at the hangar. Um, the, in the evening, they have their main stage is Spring Awakening, which is a musical. Uh, 15 minutes after the main stage is done, outside uh, under the tent is when they have this free presentation. It's called the Wedge Series, uh, and it's always Drama League directors doing new experimental work uh, right after the main stage, okay. and it's free. The Wedge is a pretty well-kept secret in Ithaca, I think. A lot of people <laughs> who go to the regular hangar performances don't know about it. So do those performances go on all summer? Do they run yeah, so there along are, with the main stage th season? Yeah, for the most part. There are four Drama League directors here, um, and each of us have one Wedge show. So for these Wedge show, it, they each get two nights. Mm -hmm. um, so we have already had Austin Reagan's presentation of the Trojan Women, which was right after uh, The God of Carnage, which was the main stage at the time. Uh, and then later in the summer, uh, Anisha Katarkar and Dan Rogers will be uh, presenting Mud by Maria Arine Fornes and Crazy Locomotive, uh, respectively, um, after The Hound of the Baskervilles, which is the main stage show to come. Okay. So, yeah. So, your politics informs your theater, and you've described yourself as a director and activist. Mm -hmm. How do you see that happening? Or let's, you can talk about it generally or specifically, let's say, the choice of this play. Yeah. So, I'm still trying to figure out what it means to be a political theater maker. Um, about a year ago, I uh, was looking for more political education. Uh, so I, that's how I found the DSA, the New York City chapter. Um, I went primarily because I, I had a vague idea of what socialism means in the abstract, but I didn't understand what it practically means in the United States today. What are we doing today that can improve society? Um, I learned a whole bunch at some of the early meetings um, with Maria Svart, who's the uh, national director, but also uh, works with the New York City local chapter. Um, and I started looking into how can I bridge the gap between uh, what I do in a theater and what I either do on the street protesting or in the DSA's national office. Um, so actually in April, uh, a little while ago, uh, the New York City chapter 
hosted a staged reading of Waiting for Lefty, mm-hmm. which is a play by Clifford Odets about uh, union organizing and a, and a great big strike that happens. Um, and afterwards, we had a panel discussion of, uh, we had one uh, theater director and we had one uh, uh, union leader. And what was really f- great is the audience was split between theater people who really don't know much about unions other than their relationship to equity, the actors' right. union. Um, and then we also had some union people who hadn't necessarily been to a theater in a while. So there was a room full of people looking at each other like they're aliens <laughs> and really starting this uh, fervid, curious conversation. Um, and I could just feel like, oh, that's what I need to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I get, uh, you know, how do you turn thinkers into fighters and fighters into thinkers? Um, how can I get protesters and theater people to intermingle? So that really if, has affected uh, the plays I'm reading and the plays that I'm looking to do, and how can I really bring the social issues of plays more to the forefront? Um, I had always loved Jean Cocteau. Uh, he was an early surrealist and uh, really invented a lot of the... Uh, he was a filmmaker, too, and invented a lot of the camera techniques that now look a little silly, but at the time were these radical outrageous acts Mm -hmm. uh, with the camera. Um, So I found this one play that he did called uh, The Infernal Machine. Uh, And what I really, really loved about it was that it's not your typical Oedipus story. Uh, I mean, it still ends badly for Oedipus. Um, You know, his mom slash wife still hangs herself and he still gouges out his eyes. But the play really shows along the way all the moments when it almost stopped. Uh, and what I love about it is that it presents all these different classes. There's uh, the working class. Below that, there are children. Above that, there are the middle managers. Above that, there is the royal family, Oedipus and Jocasta and Creon. Uh, And then there's the demigods, um, the Sphinx and Anubis. And even them refer to gods above them. Um, So there's a great line in the play, uh, mystery has its own mystery, mysteries, Uh, There are gods above gods. We have ours. They have theirs. That's what's known as infinity. Mm. Um, And it really shows all these moments throughout the play where someone almost reached across class to a different class, and they got so close to stopping the fate of Oedipus. Um, But because they turned inward to only their own class, that the fate continues. And I feel with uh, the socialist struggle in the United States, as well as in history, that phenomenon continues to happen. We get so close to a chaotic intermingling of classes and a real sharing of struggle, um, but the stakes are often too high um, and we don't make that full commitment. and then we have the cross-cutting of class and race totally. that separates people into more little categories yeah. that they can't break through. And one thing I love about DSA is that there seems to be this belief that we're all working against the same problem mm-hmm. and really trying to unify our struggles um, because it's in all of our best interests to have each other's back. Um, so yeah, I, I'm... I think there's a way in which you could direct this show to be a little hopeless because, you know, the fate does happen. Um, But I'm really trying to highlight the moments where we got so close to stopping the infernal machine from continuing to let certain people grind through it to the benefit of others. So can you verbalize how you do that in terms of directing? You said you could direct this show in one way and you're directing it in a different way. How does that actually play out? Is it how you have the actors perform? Is it the staging? Mm -hmm. How do you manifest that? It often has a lot to do with focus, um, specifically the focus that I'm putting towards uh, with design. You know, am I going to highlight the moments where they almost break the machine? Um, Or am I going to highlight the moment right after the machine reorients. Um, And I've chosen to do these near breakdowns rather than the continuing and the reorienting because the machine is very adept. Capitalism has a, it's, it's really good at adapting 
to uh, near revolution. Um, and I, I find so much hope in not only the play, but also in history, when did we get very close to, to revolution? And we should of course be analyzing where it went wrong, um, but I don't think we should discredit the, um, the hope. You know, like, yes, Occupy Wall Street broke down, but it still happened. And that's remarkable, you and know? And it changed the discourse. And it changed the discourse. Um, you know, so that wasn't the straw that broke the camel's back, but I think that that will give hope to the future revolution, the future straw that will break the camel's back, that will present another option after capitalism. So, so let's talk a little bit about the other play that you directed, The Emperor's New Clothes, because that certainly for a fairy tale, for a children's story, is very political. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a very different show. It was a musical by Aaron's and Flaherty, and they're the same people that created Susicle, which is also a secretly subversive uh, theater piece. Um, but what I was really fascinated with and what I really fell in love with the show is that it, it's really a story of identity and uh, this young emperor uh, f creating his own identity. Um, he becomes uh, the emperor at age 14 very quickly. Uh, he feels very young and, in and insecure. He doesn't know how to be an emperor yet. He's only f 14. So one of his vi advisors tells him, you know, go down to the portrait hall, look at your ancestors' portraits, they'll give you inspiration. He goes there and he sees all, all these big men who are strong and mighty and courageous, you know, all these things. And, you know, he's not those things. And I really think that children, I, I believe that all children have that experience of, you know, maybe when deciding how to get dressed in the morning, at whatever age the, ch the decision making goes to the child, they're going to compare what they're going to wear against the uh, model identities that they have largely mom and dad. Do I want to dress like mom or do I want to dress like dad? Uh, and what's, I think growing up, our parents become not only our first models, but also the first thing that, the first models we push against mm -hmm. um, as we find our own. So, you know, when we go to either high school and certainly college, we're presented with all these other identities that we could be. Um, and what's so great about the emperor's new clothes is that he, you know, he, literally is playing a game of dress up. He tries on a bunch of different identities, but ends up choosing a new one at the end. And I just think that is such a brave thing to do, to be faced with many options. And you know, it would be so easy to take one of those options, but it's actually the more radical um, act to create your own. And it's a scary act to create your own. Um, and one of my beliefs as a socialist is that, uh, you know, to get a more equitable world, we're going to have to celebrate diversity and celebrate the weird and celebrate the strange and just celebrate what makes one person different from the norm, not what makes someone a success story of the norm. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. So what, what kind of identity does he adopt? So he's a bookworm. And he's uh, nerdy. Uh, so throughout the show, he's trying on, um, you know, different glasses, different coats. He tries on a sequin dress at one point. Um, and he ends up uh, creating his own crown. That really becomes mm -hmm. the thing that he's going to uh, focus on. At the beginning of the play, when he's initially crowned, he has his father's crown. And it's enormous and it, you know, covers his face. And, he, you know, it's, it just doesn't fit. He doesn't fit into this identity. And by the end of the play, uh, he takes a piece of paper, uh, colors his own design on it, cuts it out, fits it perfectly to his head, and, you know, and lets that inform the rest of his, uh, not only clothing choices, but in how he's going to run his empire. Uh, he no longer is afraid to use his books to uh, help the empire solve its problems. Okay. So, so yeah. both of the plays really deal with parent-child issues. Yes. And, um, and <laughs> In very different ways. <laughs> on society, yeah.
Yeah. Interesting. So I've been to children's, those children's plays at the Hangar Theater, and the kids in the audience tend to get very involved in the plays mm -hmm. and very vocal. Yes. Um, were they, they give him a lot of support for those choices? Yes. And that was actually, I think, one of the biggest learning experiences of my life uh, in the theater because I had never done children's theater before. Um, so there were just certain things that I didn't, realize just how big of a reaction would happen. So for example, at one point, there's a song where uh, Emperor Marcus tries on a sequin dress. You know, so we have a, a male actor trying on a pink sequin dress. And it really just became an unstoppable moment. Uh, the children were cracking up and shouting and it was just so funny to them. Um, but I put it at a particular moment in the play when there were lines right after. So I really had to learn where do I need to give time for the children to react so that they don't miss the lines that come right after. Mm -hmm. um, and all, and especially at the very end when he comes, you know, obviously uh, the magical outfit is invisible. It's nothing. So he comes out in his underwear at the end. And that's another unstoppable moment. The children just, I mean, they love it. It's hilarious. Um, and they're also, for many of them, it's their first time in a theater. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're in a room with, 300 other kids and they're cracking each other up yeah. um, and it was it was really cool to learn how do I give them the space to react and then how do I pull them back so that we can continue with the story so um, I, I was so grateful to the drama leading to the hangar for giving me that experience to do something that I had never done before and probably wasn't overly qualified for. Uh, but now I, you know, I feel like I have learned so much and could do children's theater again yeah. with more adeptness. So I have to warn you that the audience at the Wedge performances <laughs> doesn't get that involved yeah. and that vocal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you'll get them involved, but they won't express it in the same way. Of course. I mean, that's also what's so great about children's theater is because they haven't been told to be quiet in a theater yet. Mm -hmm. So they just give you so much. Um, you know, when, when my friends, when my mom especially comes to see the Infernal Machine, they're going to say, we love it. Amazing. Even if they were bored. But if a child is bored at any second, you know, you're going to know. They're going to start playing with their shoe or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So they're so honest, which is really an opportunity for a director to yeah. mine for information. Yeah. So, so getting back to the Infernal Machine and your interpretation, when you're working with the actors, you know, how much are you, they're working from the script, mm -hmm. and how much are you kind of, I don't know, pulling them away from the script or adding to the script? How does that yeah. work? Well, it's, it's really a conversation. You know, the, the process of doing a play is very, very long, and many things I... Except it's not very long. You yeah, for nine this. days. But even with rehearsal. only nine days, once the actors come in, there was months leading up to oh, those nine days. Okay. You know, so I've been um, not only doing my own research on the play to make sure that I fully understand it, um, but also working with the designers to make sure that not only our set design, the costumes, the lights, the sounds are all supporting uh, the concept that we're putting forth. So by the time the actors come in, you know, I might know what moment is the loudest moment, mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily know the uh, emotional journeys that the actors are going to ride on to get to that moment. Um, so once the actors come in, they're really finding their character interpretations. What do I want? How am I going to get it? What happens if I don't? Um, and that interplay between all these characters trying to just get what they want, um, it's my job to manipulate that interplay uh, so that it is resting on the design and so that the design is supporting the actors and the actors are supporting the, the, the design so that the audience gets the concept as clearly and as uh, most compellingly and most beautifully as possible. Okay, so you mentioned beautifully, and I, I wanted to ask you about this. How do you balance... You want to get a certain message across, but you don't want to be too didactic. You mm -hmm. want to keep the beauty. You want to keep the art. How do you balance that? Trial and error. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, um, I'm a big believer in uh, running 
uh, running the whole play over and over again. So even if we've done uh, one scene for most of the day, I really like to run the whole play at the end of the day, bring in someone who maybe hasn't seen it before, and I love to ask them, so what did you see? Uh, you know, if I'm doing uh, Cats, the musical, it'd be great for me to say, what, do, what was it about? What did you see? So that if they tell me that they saw a play about dogs and I'm doing Cats, that's like really helpful information mm -hmm. for me. Uh, and I think the same thing is true with a play that is either too didactic or not. Um, you know, if someone tells me that they saw a whole bunch of people yelling politics, as opposed to the story of a man trying to stop his fate from happening, um, that's really good information for me. Mm -hmm. When I ask the audience about uh, what did you see, they, I hope, will be telling me uh, the story of this man and these other people trying to stop the fate of Oedipus. Um, but what I, when I ask them what it makes them think of or what it drew up in them, that's where I hope they see the connections with... Uh, Occupy Wall Street almost succeeding or a Black Spring almost happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where do they see the interplay of class in modern society is what they're... Uh, in, it, the play should inspire them to those topics as opposed to be representations of those topics themselves. Because right. I could do a yeah. play about Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. but, um, and you know, I hope I do it in my life, but this particular play is a play about the Oedipus family and the myth, mm -hmm. which will hopefully inspire dialogue. Right. On... Are there any talkback opportunities? Uh, none that are officially organized, uh, but uh, I am rapidly seeking audience to tell me, what did you see? Uh -huh. um, because, you know, I am trying to, uh, you know, I love the play and I would love to have it keep going and keep developing mm -hmm. um, possible productions after this one. So the more audience feedback I get, the more uh, information I have as to how to make my story clearer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and are you using program notes for the audience to kind of channel them at all? Yeah, um, so we're certainly going to give uh, probably an overview of the myth of Oedipus, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think a lot of people learn it in school, but, you know, it's always good to have a refresher. Um, but we haven't yet figured out how much or how... Uh, overtly, we want to put notes in the program about the political engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, what I hope instead is that everyone from the audience either finds me or an actor or just someone on the project to say, hey, let's get a beer. Tell me everything you know. Okay. You know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So a while ago you mentioned Odette's and one of the things that I was going to ask you about was whether you had done any work with plays by Odette's and the other more explicitly political writers of the 20th century? Yeah, it was the first Odette's play I had ever done. Um, it was also probably the most overtly political, where the author meant it to be political, mm -hmm. play that I've ever done. But I've always had an interest in uh, political writers. Uh, there's one uh, theater theorist uh, and artist who I greatly admire named Augusto Boal. Um, and he created this uh, theater technique called Theater of the Oppressed, largely based on Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy mm -hmm. of the Oppressed. Um, and he really looks at, uh, he, he, you know, he has writing about how you can specifically engage politics overtly. How can you take a newspaper article and literally put it either on stage or turn the street into a mm -hmm. stage? Um, so I am still trying to educate myself as to do I want to create political theater in a theater or do I want to create protest that is theatrical? And how do I, what is the space between those two things? Um, but Odette's was such a wonderful uh, way to begin that exploration and Infernal Machine is definitely a continuance. Um, and in the fall, you know, we're hoping to do staged adaptations of uh, the Democratic primary debates. Mm -hmm. um, so experimenting, doing weird stuff with smart people, trying to figure it out. <laughs> okay, and street theater, where do you see that going through the next couple of years, especially in terms of the presidential race? Yeah, I just want to see more of it. Um, I really think it is artists' responsibility to help shape um, the mass of information that there is out there. 
Um, and I just don't think enough uh, artists are helping sift through it. You know, um, there was a great campaign of rainbows and equal signs uh, in the lead up to uh, the Supreme Court decision that made uh, same-sex marriage nationwide, which was wonderful and like such a thing we should all be proud of. Um, but we also had other issues at the Supreme Court that got less attention, including a, a gigantic threat to unions on whether uh, right to work will go national. Um, so I really, I don't have much experience in street theater. It's something that I'm still trying to educate myself on how to do it and how do I want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I really hope that uh, it builds and we see more and more of it. Because um, there, especially with the election, there is just so much information and we need artists to really help us translate that information with our guts and with our hearts rather than with our minds, which is what the media does ad infinitum. Right. Yeah. And I remember in 2000 there was billionaires for Bush or Gore. Yeah doing a lot of street theater. And by 2004, they had realized that maybe it was just billionaires for Bush. And, you know, so sometimes that street theater evolves as the politics evolve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I just hope there's more of it. Uh, the New York chapter uh, of DSA actually has a few theater makers in it. Uh, New York just has a ton of theater makers. Right, sure. Um, so we've been slowly starting to organize and percolate ideas at, at what we might do. Okay. I mean, it would be great if some of those were available, you know, through the internet and video ways. Yeah. Or so, we are also available for touring if anyone wants to fund us. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's an idea. Yeah. So um, I've been talking today with Paul Bedard, who we're lucky to have in Ithaca for the summer as a directing fellow at the Hangar Theater. And Paul, as you've heard, his work is evolving in a number of different directions. I mean, we've talked about children's theater and street theater and political theater and traditional theater. And I've looked at your website, mm -hmm. which is... It's uh, paulhbedard.com. And I expect that through your website, people will be able to follow the progress of these different ideas. Yep, I have and a blog your... on my website where I talk about the plays I'm doing. Well, it's the, the concept of combining your socialism with your art is really interesting and a way of helping socialism reach more people yeah. um, in a way that's entertaining and different from what they usually get. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks for watching DSA Presents.